en question. Please be seated. Le président, veuillez vous asseoir. Je déclare le ouverte. Today, the chamber continues to hear the closing statement in case 002 and for the the floor will be given to the co-prosecutor to continue with the rebuttal statement. Ms. Sakolboti, please report the attendance of the parties and other individuals to today's proceedings. Greffier, Mr. President, for today's proceedings to hear the closing statements. All parties to this case are present. Sont Mr. Noutier is Edouard present in a holding non cell downstairs. He has waived his right to be present in the courtroom. The waiver has been delivered to the Greffi. Thank you. Merci. President, thank you. The Chamber now decides Merci. on the request by Nunchier. La Chambre Nunchier. doit se prononcer sur une requête présentée par Nunchier. Celui-ci a fait remettre à la Chambre un document de renonciation daté du 22 juin 2017. Il est indiqué qu'en raison de son état de santé, Mot de dos et mot de tête, il ne peut rester longtemps assis ou se concentrer durant longtemps. Pour assurer sa participation effective aux audiences, il renonce à son droit d'être dans le prétoire en ce jour. La Chambre est aussi saisie d'un rapport du médecin traitant des CETC concernant Nunchea et daté du 22 juin 2017. Le médecin y relève qu'aujourd'hui, L'état général de Nunchea est stable, mais il souffre de douleurs lombaires aiguës lorsqu'il reste longtemps assis. Le médecin recommande à la Chambre de faire droit à la demande de l'accusé. Par ces motifs et en application de la règle 80.7 du règlement intérieur, La Chambre fait donc droit à la dite requête. Nunchia pourra donc suivre les débats depuis la cellule temporaire en bas. La Chambre est priée de raccorder la cellule temporaire au prétoire pour que Nunchia puisse suivre l'audience à distance toute la journée. And I now hand the floor présent, to the co-prosecutors to continue with the rebuttal. Qui pourra continuer à exposer sa réplique. Good morning, Your Honors, Counsel to the Civil Parties je vous, je um, and to all present. Your Honors, yesterday we, Hier, I spoke in some detail about international law and why it's absolutely impossible under international law for the defense to justify a single detention without legal process, a single torture of the victims of the Khmer Rouge, or a single extrajudicial execution that took place throughout the country, including in the security centers, cooperatives and work sites charged in this case. But the Nunchia defense in particular has claimed that they have rewritten history by uh, explaining in their version of how their own party, the CPK, was ridden with factions intent upon overthrowing Paul Pot, Nunchia, Kyusampan, this center center. Le centre du that these were opponents actively engaged in attempts to overthrow the rule. In addition, Your régime. Honors, to being Donc, irrelevant legally to the charges, Nunchia's version of history is simply untrue. It's the same fake history that the Khmer Rouge tried to sell to the world at the time of their crimes, that they tried to sell to their own people, explain to their own people their bloody rule to justify it. It simply isn't true. And if we take a little time, which I'd like to do this morning, to go through some of what they cite as supposedly evidence 
les supposées preuves avancées par la défense. We'll see that it is without Et nous pourrons basis. constater It's based que ces preuves sont illogical des nuits de Il s'agit de supputations and in many illogiques cases, et dans bien des cas, it's based on tout torture, cela se fonde on confessions sur des documents recueillis sur la torture people. et des aveux recueillis sous la torture. As I said yesterday, there's absolutely no reason legally for the prosecution to deny resistance because it would have no effect. And if there had been resistance, there'd be no reason for anyone or more attempts within the party to overthrow the regime. There'd be no reason for anyone to deny it. If you look at uh, other instances where people have lived through horrible oppressive regimes, such as, such as the Nazi occupation of Europe, you don't find years later that people who resisted are afraid to speak of it. Just the opposite. Les gens qui What you find is, in some cases, people who actually were parfois, collaborating with the regime suddenly claim that they were resisting it. But let's look at the kind of evidence that Nunchia cites in his arguments, but particularly in his brief. And if you look at his brief, he places si great emphasis mémoire, on a person who didn't testify, sur evidence that was not admitted. And I simply, Your Honor, don't have time to go through the reasoning behind the chamber for not admitting evidence. It's a very good reasoning, but the public can find that in those written decisions. But they talk a lot about witness number one, who they said was interviewed by Ted Sambat, didn't testify in this case. I want to talk about why they claim that this is a witness that's so important to showing the attempts to overthrow the regime. Witness number one, we don't know the name. The persons who interviewed them refused to give us the name of witness number one. We don't know who it was. Nous son but, Nun, but let's look at a few things this person says, Examinons and I think anyone who judges it objectively will say that witness number one's version is wholly incredible. First of all, this is a person who claims he was imprisoned in Tool Slang without explaining how he survived that experience. Although he claims he was part of a plot against Pol Pot and was imprisoned in Tool Slang, somehow he survived. Part of his explanation of his experience in Tool Slang shows absolutely he's lying about that. One of the things he says is that in Tool Slang, the regime planted agents among prisoners. We've talked to, we've had evidence from Doik, from interrogators, from others who worked at Tool Slang. There's no evidence that any Rien the regime ever planted agents among prisoners, given the absolute horrendous, life-threatening conditions of anyone in prison at Tool Slang, shackled 24 hours a day, no, one, no agents would be among the prisoners. But the main uh, piece of evidence that Nguyen Chia cites in his Nguyen brief Chia and in his oral arguments is he says cite. that witness one in May 1975, just a month after the victory of the Khmer Rouge, the capture of Phnom Penh, attended a meeting in Phnom Penh, a secret meeting, he says, he calls it, of 300 cadres. 300 cadres, he said, from every zone except the southwest. That would include zones that always remained extremely loyal to the regime. And, he says, from Et all of the ministries. Dit, y avait là des gens Among, de tous les and that this meeting was plotting against Pol Pot. A, a secret meeting of 300 people in the middle of Phnom Penh supposedly plotting against Pol Pot. It's simply incredible. And who does he say list among the uh, attendees of this meeting? He meant Lis Chun Chun, Chun Chun, who was the uh, you know, one of the famous three brothers, long-time loyal supporters of the Khmer Rouge. They remained so even Rouge. after they lo lost power. Même après la perte de he was the Rouge. head, the minister Lui, of health, the head of the health section. He was Paul Pot's personal doctor. 
C'était le médecin According to witness Fox. one, he was at this meeting openly plotting a rebellion against Pol Pot. Who else does he say attended the meeting? Ying Tari, the Minister of Social Affairs, the wife of Ying Tari, Pol Pot's sister-in-law. I mean, this is absolutely absurd evidence. What else does witness one say, which of course the defense ignores in their brief and in their oral argument? At one point when he's asked if Nun Chia attended meetings, he said, Nun Chia worked with Lan Nol. So does the defense want us to believe that, that Nun Chia was actually working with the Lan Nol regime? So the witness they rely upon actually paints Nun Chia as one of the traitors. The next witness, again, that didn't nouveau, testify, il y a un autre témoin, is someone déposé, that's named Barbara, in the book by Ted Sambat and Gina Chan. Chan. And Chan. And in that book, is called Chan Savut. Chan Savut. Now, the chamber attempted to call this person La as a witness, could not be located, but there was someone with a similar name who apparently had been interviewed by a foreigner. Nun Chia says that this is probably the same person, and we certainly agree that there's reason to believe that that's likely, named Chen Samut. But the witness unit spoke to this person twice. And first, they read to the person the version of what he supposedly had told Tet Sambat that's printed in behind the killing fields. And he said, that wasn't true. Then they went back, as your honors instructed them to do, and read from these transcripts that Lemkin had provided, where it talked about Chan Savut, or this witness three, attending meetings were supposedly plotting against Pol Pot and naming various people. And Chan Samut said he didn't even know these people and he'd never been to those meetings. So this kind of evidence doesn't help Nun Chea at all. And actually, if you look at what this person said in these interview transcripts provided by Lemkin, they absolutely contradict Nun Chia's case. Nun Chia has tried to claim all the crimes at Trapang Tama were by Ru Nim, who had a plan to make the regime fail, to starve the people, to make the regime look bad. That itself doesn't make much sense how if you're doing a revolt you would try to si get the people to be against you. But if you look at the transcript provided by Lemkin, si what it actually says, Lemkin, according to Witness 3, trois, is that Runim planned Runim first, quote, the psychology war. With people, we had to be cold cite, without smashing. Punishment, no matter they were wrong, we would not si smash fautes, or punish them. He said we had to be cold dit, to make them love us. So witness number three, Ce this trois, donc, supposedly Chan Savut, was contradicting completely Nun Chia's case, saying that Ru Nim's plan was to treat the people very well, unlike the center's policy, not to smash and to make the people love us. Now, of the witnesses that were named by Tet Sambat or in the Lemkin transcripts, the chamber was able to find one of them called Chiu Chuan. And he testified he absolutely contradicted everything that was written about his supposed involvement in coups against the regime. His evidence was so damaging to Nun Chea that Nun Chea took the position that this is the wrong person. This is not the person Tet Sambat interviewed. But we actually had videotape of Chiu Chuan sitting next to Tet Sambat, part of the additional material material from the enemies of the people in a video conference with victims in the United States in Long Beach. Chil Chun was the person that talked to Tset Samba. And in the book, Behind the Killing Fields, uh, the book says, Chil Chun said in an interview, I was very sorry our plan was not successful. 
What does Lun Chia say to try to explain that? He says, Tet Sambat does not speak English. Well, this is rather strange since they put great emphasis on what Robert Lemkin could supposedly say, who doesn't speak Khmer and said all he learned from these interviews, the interviews were translated to him by Tet Sambat. So they're saying that Lemkin relied upon a person who didn't speak English at all. And then we go through what Nunchea claims were various coup attempts. And please, let's look a little bit at the evidence behind what they claim they have proven in their history, the fake history of these coup attempts. Besides the May 75 meeting I talked about, I think the second coup attempt they talk about is a explosion in 1976 at an ammo dump in Siem Reap. Your honors know from the evidence that DK Radio at the time blamed the United States, said that this was bombing by American planes. And various other experts or analysts have speculated that it was a bombing by possibly Thai airplanes or Vietnamese airplanes. What doesn't make any sense at all is Nun Chia's new claim. Well, I mean, they started this claim during the regime as part of the justification for their killing. Uh, what doesn't make sense is why would they say this was a plot by Koi Tun? to overthrow the regime, because the ammo dump was in an area of his influence. Well, Your Honours, why would Khoi Thun, if he's planning to overthrow the central government in Phnom Penh, blow up his own ammo dump? It makes no sense at all. If you're, if you're planning to attack the regime, you blow up the regime's ammunition and you attack Phnom Penh. De but Nguyen Chia claims now Or, présent, that Khoi Chun was a Vietnamese agent, that this was Vietnamien part of a Vietnamese plot. It's interesting then to look at what Nguyen Chia said to Tet Sambat. And there's, there's a section in that book livre, where Nguyen Chia is talking about the various people that he, the regime killed. Le régime a tué. And among those is a Et section a called the Friends, those he killed among his friends. And Khoi Chun is in that section. And what does Nguyen Chia say about Khoi Thun? It says, quote, according to Nguyen Chia, this is on page 108 behind the killing field. According to Nguyen Chia, he's talking about during the Civil War, Khoi Thun's men were arresting Vietnamese soldiers who brought goods to Cambodia, which created tension in an already strained situation. Nguyen Chia told Tet Sambat, Khoi Thun, quote, he was trying to make us and Vietnam become enemies. So we see that Nguyen Chia now, again, contradictory versions of his history, his fake history. He told Tet Sambat, Nguyen Chia, uh, excuse me, Khoi Thun was trying to make the DK Khmer Rouge and Vietnamese enemies. Now he's saying Khoi Thun was a Vietnamese agent. What's the third incident that Nguyen Chia's fake history says was a coup attempt? This is a good one. This is what, re when we heard the thunder yesterday, I was reminded of this. Nguyen Chia talks about the fact that at about 4.30 in the morning, on uh, the 2nd of April, 1976, apparently a grenade exploded behind the royal palace. A single grenade tossed against an outside wall or exploded next to an outside wall in the dead of night near no one, with no one injured, no apparent target for that grenade. What sense does that make that that was a coup attempt? Now, some poor soldier named Yim Sabat was arrested for that, taken to S21, and according to Nguyen Chia's defense, not mistreated, they claim, not mistreated. We know how people were treated in S21. 
nous savons comment les gens ont été traités à Without any Et cette personne, sans avoir été maltraitée, supposément aurait involved avoué for years avoir and été impliquée pendant des années à une conspiration vis-à-vis d'un régime. Et la personne aurait donné no des noms. C'est tout simplement absurde. This whole incident of the grenade against the palace wall in the middle of the night with no target being a coup attempt just shows the regime's attempts to distort history, to spread paranoia, to justify killings. Now another interesting witness relied upon very heavily in the Nunchia's arguments is the testimony of Sam Hong, who was from Division 310. Evidence that's simply not credible, and it'll take me a little bit of time, I just want to remind you about the history of his evidence. Sam Horn originally was interviewed by D.C. Camp. In that interview, first of all, he said he was a battalion commander. Now, when he came to court, it turned out he said he claimed only to be a platoon commander. So apparently he greatly exaggerated in his DC camp interview his rank and his importance in the Khmer Rouge movement. Also, it's interesting, in his DC camp interview, he gives details about fighting in Vietnam, quite chilling details about his own involvement in fighting in Vietnam. And he's asked by DC Cam if his troops purposely burned down Vietnamese houses. And he answered, and I quote, yes, we burned them down. We never let them stay safe. These Vietnamese houses were built next to each other. It was so easy for us. We just set house on fire and it spread to all the rest. He added even more details about his battles in Vietnam. He claimed that they captured three Vietnamese civilians. And when asked about that, he gave DC Cam these details. He said, quote, they were normal people, like villagers. We just had to say that we had arrested UN soldiers, or enemy, UN, and so in fact they were civilians, such as farmers with small houses like our people here. However, they were accused of being UN soldiers and forced to confess that they were UN soldiers during interrogation. <coughs> what did, excuse me, what did Sam Hong say Sam about Hon Vietnam when he came to court and testified Vietnam under oath here? Bar, he said he never was in Vietnam. Vietnam. He said he never even fought on the Vietnamese battlefront. So apparently he was telling war stories Donc that simply weren't true to DC camp. <laughs> now, what about his involvement in, uh, so let me, one more incident Encore interesting from his uh, statement in DC CAM and his testimony, where Sam Hohn exaggerated his own importance. He told DC CAM that Donc, when he was in Division 310, which at that time was a center, excuse me, a northern division that became part of the center army, he said, quote, I was then always with our Samdek Prime Minister. And he confirmed to DC CAM he meant Prime Minister Hun Sen. He told DC CAM Hun Sen was the deputy commander of Division 310, again, a center division that had previously belonged to the northern zone. But, Your Honor, as we know from the evidence, defense knows, and they even brought this up during Sam Hohn's testimony, the deputy commander of Division 310 was Vong, V-O-E-U-N-G. We know also that he was eventually arrested and executed at, S at uh, S21. He's number 13594 on the, S on the OCIJ list. And as the defense has repeatedly acknowledged throughout the trial, the evidence is that Hun Sen wasn't in the northern zone. He served in the early years of the DK regime in the, in the, during the Civil War in the eastern zone. 
So what we can see from Sam Donc, Hohn's testimony and statement at DC Cam les déclarations is that he greatly exaggerated his rank, he greatly exaggerated his battlefield grade, experience, son expérience de and he exaggerated or lied about his association with the Prime Minister, or simply avec le Premier ministre, was il a menti very, very confused. But what did he say to the DC Cam about resistance to the regime? Concernant la résistance au régime? First, when he was asked about the regime, he on told DC Cam this. I knew this regime clearly. Bien ce régime. However, I Une could fois, not escape or resist. He went on to say, Ensuite, dit, I never toujours, forgot about Pol Pot regime. And from day to day, I tell my children and grandchildren jour, that they have to be firmly against such a regime and to prevent it from happening again in Cambodia. Now, it was only near the end of his interview, after he made this statement about the need to resist such regimes, that he then claimed the following. He said, on his Division 310 commander was right to resist such a regime. And then he went on to claim that, oh, he himself had been ordered by On to transport weapons from where they were around Phnom Penh, where he was based around Phnom Penh, to Kampong Cham, he said to be used to attack Phnom Penh, the radio station in the airport. Notice, what sense does that make? If a division based in Phnom Penh is planning a coup to be implemented by an attack on Phnom Penh, why would they then send their weapons to Kampong Cham, especially since Kampong Cham at that time was the base of K-Pok, loyal DK, bloody commander. Le commandant sanguinaire, no sense at all. loyal au Kampucha démocratique. Cela n'a aucun sens. Now, when he came and testified in his direct examination, he was asked about by the prosecution about on. Il a été interrogé par l'accusation sur eux. And he said, et voici ce qu'il a dit. He knew nothing il a dit, about on collaborating with any enemies of the DK regime. De eux avec des ennemis du régime. And he said, des, quote, on his cite, political tendency or whatever, we didn't have the knowledge of that. Nous savions rien. He testified under oath, serment, quote, il a dit, I never received any direct order from him, meaning on. I was at 10.06 on the day he testified. Le jour de sa déposition. Sam Hohn did tell us something that Sam we know from many Hon other witnesses. A dit une chose que nous After Hohn was arrested and taken to S21, his Hon confession was broadcast to all of his troops. It was common knowledge. Now, Your Honor, there are many second-hand reports by soldiers and even by refugees where they said they've heard about resistance or plots in the DK regime, but that we should hardly be surprised about that when the regime was constantly claiming and telling people that there were plots against it, that traitors had been arrested, that attempts to uh, kill Pol Pot had been evaded. So there's nothing surprising Donc, about the regime's étonnant. propaganda having some effect and people simply repeating it. Civil Party's lawyer asked Sam Hohn again about his role Hon in the regime, and he answered the following just before 2 p.m. He said, quote, I was committed to serve the army. And as for Hohn, I did not know whether he had any plan to betray Ankar. So then why is the defense Alors, placing such heavy reliance on him? Because after lui. repeatedly claim, testifying under oath, he had absolutely no knowledge of any plots by Ohm, had never received a direct order from Ohm. Defense counsel then read back to him this statement he gave at the end of his interview to DC Cam about getting an order from Ohm and transporting weapons, about his heroic resistance against Pol Pot. And he suddenly adopted that and said, yes, that's what he did. Oui, so, Sam Ohn, that's the best witness the defense can come up with. Donc, it Sam indicates how weak these claims are. Que peut présenter la défense, cela témoigne de la faiblesse His de story is simply not credible. Il s'agit tout simplement d'un récit qui n'est pas crédible. 
You know, at one point during the testimony of Doik, uh, defense counsel put to him various statements of Sam Ohn and others from Division 310 about the supposedly 310 plot. And Doik said the following, 